Our next speaker, shortly after college, she became a part-time DJ. Please welcome Tanya. Uh, first, thanks, Jared, for inviting me to speak here, whether or not that was a good idea. Um, I didn't know what to pick for my walk-up song, so I let ChatGPT choose for me. And I was gonna, it was between early 90s hip hop or um, Taylor Swift, but I let ChatGPT do it and it came up with the Imperial Death March. So you're gonna see random Yoda mid journey art for no apparent reason. Um, it has nothing to do with the content, just my talk inspired it. <laughs> so uh, I always like, I always hope that someone like, learns something, uh, even if it's tiny when they walk away from listening to me for 20 minutes. Um, so hopefully you learn at least something here, whether it's technical or process oriented, uh, but if not, you can enjoy the mid journey art at the very least. Um, so a bit background about me. My name is Tanya Casciarelli. Um, my background is formally in computer science and biology. I started using R back in 2005 at Children's Hospital and was really just thrown into the deep end. Um, they were like, just here's some gene expression data figure stuff out between mouse normal brain models and cancer brain models. And I was like, okay, um, you know, yeah, there was like essentially the CRAN documentation back then. I feel like a, a you know, a boomer sometimes saying this, but yeah, it's, it, it was like, you had to like, learn a lot, just like dive in and do stuff. Uh, so it was scary, but you know, come a long way. Um, I've worked at a couple biotech startups out of college. Uh, we were building really sophisticated cancer models of disease and perturbing the system with drugs to understand what drug will work with a patient given their genetic makeup. Um, so really cool stuff that I think was ahead of its time, honestly. Um, this was like bioinformatics, I feel like was the OG of data science, really. Uh, but anyway, I moved from there and did some non-healthcare stuff in um, non-healthcare uh, rich industries like telecom, finance, uh, went back to healthcare, biogen, and started my company TCB Analytics in 2015. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on, on my, and that's my dog, Pork Chop. Uh, he's our chief security officer. <laughs> so to give you an idea of the project team, I'm the founder of TCB Analytics. Uh, our client is Sports Innovation Lab. We work with clients from pharma to the Department of Defense to kind of all over the map. But Sports Innovation Lab has been a longstanding client, and their goal is to acquire more fans for uh, teams and entertainment in venues and so on using data. And their client was the Washington Wizards of the NBA. So here's how this whole thing started was I started getting peppered with just completely non-contextualized random data asks. And I'm sure, how many of you has that happened to? <laughs> right, okay, a good amount of us. And it looked like this. It was like, are they sports bettors? Uh, what luxury brands do they spend the most on? Is the NBA community growing? And these are literally word for word. I copied them from a document. Um, so. I used our famous, and here's a little Yoda. He's working late, he's really pissed. He's like, what, is, what do these people want? So I used our famous corporate phrase we all love. Let's take a step back, <laughs> right? Makes you sound really smart. And try to identify some patterns within these questions. Like what are they trying to do? Is it longitudinal? Why do we care about longitudinal? Are we comparing things? Are we trying to look at frequency of shopping? Are we looking at spend? So, there's so many different things, and when people throw vague questions at you, I always say just try to get the context, the so what. So we're closing the gap between that and what data is actually available, which I'll get into in a second. Identify patterns within those questions if you can. Uh, this is a pattern here. And we threw out essentially those four pages and just started honestly fresh uh, with a real data products initials uh, requirements meeting in like our in our first technical meeting because I was hit with this and just had to go back and figure out what the heck they were doing. Turns out the wizards want to sell more tickets. Okay, could have said that to start with, right? And they want to identify high value fan segments. Of course, you want to keep your loyal fans, you want to have your high value fans spend more and so on. Great. Before I get into the data, uh, this method of rapid prototyping is something I've been pushing for years, people are probably sick of hearing me talk about it, but uh, we found a lot of value with it. It's working really well with a couple of our pharma clients right now. It allows you to demonstrate all the value before you build a full product, it allows non-technical customers to get involved early on in collaborative sessions, 
Uh, they can quickly see their feedback come to life, so they feel very involved in the process. And you get better adoption that way, I feel like, when you build data products to get them involved early on. And you don't want to build something. You want to disappear for three months, four months, five months, do this whole waterfall method, and come back and build like a Ferrari when they wanted a Jeep Wrangler, right? It's a dumb analogy, but you know, you get the idea. So you start with something that they can use, it gets better and better over time, and you quickly iterate. And that's what Shiny is so good at. So the data, the data is uh, 20 billion credit and debit transactions uh, from 2016 to present. It's on 26 million consumers in the United States. And they've tagged, I call about over 5,000 merchants. So to give you an idea, Here's some of the fields below. You've got a member ID, uh, the date of the transaction, the transaction ID, they, they bought something at Popeyes, we have the amount and the state it happened, all this. So you can imagine with 20 billion of these and tracking people over time, you can just learn so much about where people are actually spending their money. Sports Innovation Lab layered on an IP kind of on top of that with these custom communities where we group together merchants into leagues and teams and concerts and you name it. But then how do we quantify this in a way that's smart? So if you just look at like where people spend their money, it's always the top merchants, Walmart, Target, uh, Amazon, PayPal, the payment facilitators, right? So you need to find what's different. So we need a, we need a segment to compare to. So the way we do this is we want to quantify the fans we care about or the segment we care about against the general population. And in this case, the general population is our entire uh, database of transactions. Now you can get fancier, you can compare it to maybe a regional, regional group, or you can compare you know, DC fans to New York fans and so on. But in general, there's this idea of a marketing index which is used to target uh, people in ad campaigns. And it's kind of weird to understand, so I wanted to draw this out, but basically, if you've got a general population, let's pretend it's 10 people, two people shopped at Nike, 20% of the gen pop shopped at Nike. Wizards fan base, six out of 10, and we know that size is gonna be different, right? But this takes care of that. Uh, so your index would be that percentage divided by the other one, our index is 300. So basically, the Wizards fans are three times more likely to exhibit uh, the behavior shopped at Nike, then the gen pop. So now you can do this over any fan segment, uh, any time range, any community, and so on. And we've done some really cool stuff with this with the WNBA, the National Women's Soccer League, um, and a few, I think the MLS is coming up. Okay, so I'm gonna risk a live demo now. This is, after figuring all that out, this was kind of the first iteration. And hopefully you can see this, but Basically, these filters are not all here, right? These, these built up over time. We started really basic, and I just got kicked because my internet has been a little funky. Hold on. Let's see if we can reconnect. Law of live demos always. All right. And if not, I have screenshots as a backup, but it would be nice to walk you through. I was, having, I was having an issue in the back trying to connect. All right, well, while that maybe loads, go back to here. Basically, we've got a bunch of filters on the left side that were added over time. First, it was just give me the people that shop, shopped at the Wizards NBA store, for example. Uh, then they wanted to know high income, low income. Then they wanted to know the fans home CBSA if they live in the DC area. Then they figured out, actually, we want to group this by a different grouping, maybe not a category, but our custom community. Uh, and so these things just keep coming in, right? If you're building a product like this, you know how that goes. The requirements just, it's like a flood opens up, a floodgate, as soon as you release this to your users and they're super excited. So what this does is allows them to do basically all of those questions you saw. It saved me a bunch of time. I'm not going to sit there and write you know, custom queries all day. This enabled the users, the marketing experts, the analysts to do this stuff on their own. I'm all about you know, self-service and enablement and not having to like be a query, you know, just a query person in the back room 
So building a solution that actually streamlines what they're doing as well, learning about their process. They're doing all this manual stuff in Excel. I'm like, I can, we can totally do that for you, like in a shiny app. Um, so it sorts by the index, and then you can sort by a whole bunch of other things. You can sort by the frequency of the, na the national gen pop versus the Wizards fans. And then you get a little chart when you click in of a drill down. If I want to know what are they doing in uh, news and print media, we can see the athletic. Right? We can see New York Times, and we can see exactly how it compares. And when you'd say, well, maybe we should target the athletic with our keywords or our marketing campaign or whatever it is. Let's see if it, I'm just going to check one more time if it did come up. No, the internet doesn't like me. OK, it's OK. So I, just, I, I like to throw in a couple technical tidbits that I learned along the way and what helped me as well. So. Uh, we have a queries.r file where I, I started to store the SQL in kind of chunks. And every time a requirement would come in, I could just add another query. And so you can see from the shiny um, inputs, the input CBSA here is mapped over here. It might be tough to see, but we've got that kind of mapping to the queries. And then we use glue, the R package, which is super handy. It interpolates uh, SQL strings for you. And so it does this really nice thing, too. If you select multiple values, you put an asterisk at the end, it will create the in statement for you with the escape quotes and everything. So that was a really, I, I kind of backed up and refactored because I knew this was going to just keep coming in, these requests. And I wanted to, it's like saving your future self, right? Some headaches. So glue package was really uh, helpful. And this is something new that I've never done before. But I added, I exposed the SQL that's generated in the Shiny app on the front end. Because remember, this is an internal facing tool. It's like a market research streamline tool. So it enabled the business analysts, the data analysts to quickly help us test. Uh, paste the SQL into Snowflake. See if it works. Did you catch anything, a join condition that was wrong? Just exposing and being transparent about what's happening is going to help you fail faster, find bugs faster. Because uh, they're a small team. We're a small team. We're not bringing five people to build this thing with a dedicated QC tester. That's not, you know, we're, we're doing this stuff fast and in an agile way. So that was really helpful. Um, and you can see where the filters are being mapped to the SQL as well. The year, uh, the merchant, MBA, and so on. And then this was actually my first time using Memoize, which uh, for performance, and you can see Yoda's sprinting because he's so fast. Uh, Baby Yoda. I actually should say Grogu. Uh, but the items, you can specify a cache time. So expires after 24 hours, because I want the data. Let's say the data updates every day. We want to expire that cache. If you have a long run function, and where you remember, we're querying almost a terabyte of data, 26 billion rows. Most of our queries are a few seconds. Some joining the certain tables are 10, 20, 30 seconds. So what you do is you take your long running function. And you wrap memoize around it, give it the cache, and assign it to a new function name. And then every time you call that function, you use that new name, and you give it all your inputs. And if it's already been run that day, it's just immediate. And that's just really nice performance thing. If your user, if you know your clients are demoing, you can run it ahead of time, and it'll come up right away. So memoize, uh, cool package. And I think I'm, I'm good on time, right? My timer restarted. The, basically, the, the takeaways here are that we now, with those communities, we understood what Wizards fans were doing. We, we segmented them in all those millions of ways that the marketing team wanted us to do. But the tool allowed them to do that. They could take high income. They could take DC fans. They could take um, fans that were Wizards fans and also shopped uh, for online dating services. It's very flexible. So they came up with these, these takeaways like a push for more Gen Z, trying to attract more new young fans. They noticed that Wizards fans were interested in the MLS, two times as likely to show an affinity for the MLS over the general sports fans. Long story there was a two times return on ad spend after using this program. And as data scientists building data products, we, that's like the holy grail, we grow I. Uh, so I thought this was really cool. So without our data, the, camp, the Facebook results that they ran had a $2.09 ROA, ROAS, if you will, 
uh, total spend of 58 grand, total revenue of 123 grand with our targeted data, with the Shiny app, mind you, just a Shiny app that we built in. And I'll tell you, tell you how quickly it, it went. The total spend was 25,000, revenue was 110,000. They had a 111% increase in return on their ROAS. Uh, so cool, Yoda's, baby Yoda's very happy. So takeaways, again, we went from that idea. I got, we got peppered with these questions. We went back to the drawing board. We built an MVP in several weeks, uh, literally from before Christmas. They were using it the first week in January. And we had a, ran a successful campaign with the Wizards, the NBA team, three months later. And then uh, after this, they actually ran one with the Capitals. So the whole Washington, D.C. sports um, teams there. And we've been running these now with the WNBA. Uh, as well as MLS is coming up. So I think the point is always ask, so what? Don't just answer. It's, it's tempting to just write the sequel and disappear. But honestly, I think it's going to be more work for you in the end because they're going to just keep asking you for random things. And if you can get the context and piece it together in a way that's intelligent, uh, as well as visually makes sense for what they're trying to do, like what is, it, what is your client going to do with this? Why do you want to see spend over time? I mean, a lot of people, and they won't be able to tell you. It's an exercise that they're gonna start to think about in their head. Most challenging, challenging aspect of the project was the human element, right? Shiny made this all super easy. Getting those requirements was the hardest part. It's usually the hardest part of my job every day, is people. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I call consultants, uh, consultants are basically like corporate therapists. And we make people, we make people talk to each other. <laughs> so rapid prototyping is also this important bridging the gap thing that Shiny just enables data scientists to focus on what they're good at and build products quickly. And you'll be amazed at things you don't think about or you will never think about when building data products um, You know, once you start building. There's little, little things that come up that are just impossible to predict. Um, that said, here's the R packages for reference. Um, just the three that I mentioned that came in handy for us for this project. And thank you very much.